Today we're going to be presenting more advanced refrigeration topics and theory and you know, last month we went into a lot of the basics level and I hit real heavy on energy transfer and just what uh, HVAC is as a whole. This month I'm going to take a, a bit of a, a deeper dive into a much more advanced side of it where we're going to go over uh, hot gas bypass systems, reheats, and then also another big question I get is uh, loading systems or, or a cooling systems ability to load and unload, you know, working with different types of unloaders, whether it be scroll, semi-hermetic, or if you want to, we could even go as far as starting to talk about screw uh, loading and unloading and even centrifugal, um, just kind of depending on where our time lands. So the screws and unload and the centrifugal side, uh, we'll, we'll just see where we stand with time when I get into that. We're going to start off with hot gas bypass systems. So ultimately a hot gas bypass, its main function is to keep the evaporator saturation at a, elevated enough to keep it out of freezing at a lower load condition. So for example, uh, we recently put in some York uh, air, uh, uh, air cooled condensers. So it's basically just one big split system, 100 ton. As part of the staging on that system, circuit one has a hot gas bypass circuit. And if you actually look at the, the staging in the book, it stages uh, is compressor one with hot gas, and that is stage one. And then uh, stage two, is just compressor one by itself, no hot gas. And the reason why they're doing that is uh, this unit is controlling off of discharge air. So an RTUs will take the same uh, type of approach. Now it does get a little more in depth and we'll, I'll, I'll backtrack on that. But a lot of RTUs, it's, the hot gas side of it is built into the staging. So we're trying to produce a 55 degree discharge air on this system. Okay, that's our set point. As we're rolling through, we know that if we uh, stage down far enough, so let's say we needed uh, stage four in this particular case would be uh, three compressors, right? So we are staging down and we get to stage two uh, and it's just running one compressor and we're still satisfying. Now this may be something this time of year, late in the evening, uh, say after the things are cooling off, quite a bit or we're kind of coming out of that stage of the season now going into summer so this is going to be a less of a thing but let's say it gets down into the 60s and 70s at night and it's not that hard to reach a 55 degree supplier with that you know one compressor may be too much still on the on the return of this system if it's still trying to run and process and what it can happen is as the load continues to drop, you know, you were talking typically a zoned VAV type system at this point, uh, that fan is going to keep backing off because the VAVs and the dampers, the fan power boxes are choking down. So you're reducing airflow. As we talked about last month, when you reduce airflow, you reduce load. So you just don't have as much load going through the coil. On top of the fact, your return air is also dropping in temperature. So those are the two factors you got to think about. Not only is the sensible and, and ultimately the latent reducing, you're also reducing fan speed because there's less demand. That's going to put you in a position to where you, even with just one compressor on a massive coil, you might start to run a low saturation, low enough to possibly uh, begin to ice the coil in some way. And if it's allowed to run like that for any length of time, obviously it's, it's going to freeze over. So our solution is to stage that uh, circuit back further by adding a hot gas into the suction. And ultimately that is its main goal. And typically a system like this, a true hot gas, it's going to dump that in. I said the suction a second ago. I technically, I shouldn't have said it that way. It's going to put it into the distributor going into the coil, the evaporator coil. So what that would look like, uh, let's see, you've got your uh, con condenser, uh, you've got a compressor, CP, you've got a discharge line going into, and technically it would be coming up here, going into the condenser, 
you got your liquid line coming out, going into the metering device, and then that feeds through a distributor uh, into your evaporator. And then from there, we're going to feed back out the top of that, back into the suction of the compressor. So in this scenario, our load is down, and we need to make sure that our saturation doesn't drop too low. Another scenario where this could become the case, even in this time of year, is a data room. So if you're working on a crack unit, computer, uh, um, yeah, computer room AC, thank you. Uh, these, this is a real scenario where you're going to see this at 100 degrees outside. Uh, anyway, so we've got our liquid line coming across, our, our staging, our load drops low enough to where one compressor is still too much for the circuit. So we end up taking a line off of our discharge and running it in and tying it directly into the distributor before we branch off to go to the coil. Uh, some distributors have a hot gas bypass tap directly molded into them. Some of them, especially crack systems, uh, I've seen, uh, who was it, Data Air was big on, they had a distributor block and then they had a, a, just a generic T sweat onto that distributor block uh, coming out of the valve and then they went into another distributor um, that branched out. I don't know, I'm assuming it looks factory when I saw it, you know, uh, hindsight kind of talking it out, it sounds less factory. Anyway, point is, uh, it could have a couple of different flavors of what it looks like. So, but this is what it's doing. And so what its job is, there will be some form of a valve here in this system that um, when we need to take another stage down, we actually bypass the condenser and dump hot gas directly into uh, this flash gas. And that helps kind of heat it up and that helps us reduce capacity. Uh, now typically, um, the liquid line, on, I'll use those 100 ton condensers as an example. This hot gas bypass line was, a, uh, was 5 eighths in size. The liquid line was inch and an eighth going into the metering device and then coming out was an inch and five eighths per, per coil. So um, that's just to feed that one valve, but the hot gas was only five eighths in size, dumping into an inch and five eighths distributor. So we're not completely bypassing the coil. It is a intentional, uh, I'm gonna say metered, amount. Yeah, it's, it's not just a full flow, no condenser at all. It's, it's only intended to do just enough to keep your saturation high enough to maintain low. So you say you're getting down into the lower 30s on saturation, that, that bypass might bring you back up into the mid to upper 40s. Sometimes, you know, if it's oversized, maybe even into the 50s. Typically, if it's sized correctly, it won't be that extreme. Is the bypass typically just open closed like a solenoid or is it more so like step? So that takes us into this list. There's several different ways it can be done. You have an AXV, which is an automatic expansion valve. You have a PR, which is a pressure regulator. Uh, an HPR, which is a head pressure regulator, uh, also known as a head pressure control valve. Uh, how, what is, what's another term? These technically have a couple of different Turn. Anyway, I, I know them as HPRs. That's what I was trained on when I did low temp. Uh, that's, that's what we called them. And then you, have, you can have an actual EXV. So Aon and the Daikin Rebel systems, their outside air units, are real big on using EXVs for the hot gas bypass side of the system. The uh, EXVs are also real popular on the reheat side as well. So you can see either way. Uh, we'll get into the reheat. And you could also have solenoids, so train. Train is big on using solenoids. Uh, this, hmm? Like on your Intellipacks? Yes, yeah, Intellipacks will have uh, solenoids in the hot gas. Um, the, uh, uh, this split system has a solenoid. It just fires that coil and it opens the valve up. And to my understanding, yeah, these this solenoid isn't anything special. It's not like it's uh, restricted down or is metering the, the flow. It's just a standard 5.8 solenoid, but they've, they've 
intentionally designed it to where five-eighths is enough flow off the discharge to accomplish the desired result. Which that goes, that an engineer did all the math on that. That's not something we're gonna factor in the field. Uh, some of the uh, some of the data room or the uh, uh, some of the crack systems we work on, you might see a uh, you know say it's got a, a half inch liquid line, um, you know, and so at that point it's probably got you know inch and eighth distributor. Well, it may have a half inch, uh, either half inch or I don't know if I've seen one as small as three eighths. I think the smallest hot gas I've ever worked on was was probably half inch. Um, but a lot of them, even if the, dis even if the size is, is bigger, the most common I see are either AXV or solenoid. These are the two most commons on, I'm going to say, older equipment. A lot of the new stuff that's, that's new updated design are producing an EXV style. Most everybody is converting to that. I don't think the new IntelliPak series, I think they're still uh, solenoids. I don't think they've, they've upgraded to EXV yet. Uh, cause those are still TXV on the, um, on the indoor coils. So they've not made that step, even with the new TU system. So if they have, it's, honestly, it's probably an upgrade option. I don't know. I've, I've not seen that side of it. I'd be surprised, though, if you didn't have an option to upgrade that system to an EXV uh, base. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so an AXV, automatic expansion valve. It, uh, you don't see too many of them anymore on, on a lot of systems. They used to be a lot more popular. Uh, vastly misunderstood. It took me a while to really understand the concept, if I'm being honest. But they will look something in the ballpark of this drawing, kind of, sort of. And you'll have outlet. Actually, they won't be that sized up. A lot of times, they'll actually be kind of, if they may be a little bigger, if bigger at all. Okay, there's a typical AXV. Uh, yeah, yeah, essentially, the, the major difference you'll see is the head is different. See, a TXV has your sensing bulb coming off, but an AXV, what immediately gives it away is it'll have the same style body. Like I said, the outlet port won't be like a dramatic step up. It's not, it's job in this particular application is not to flash anything. It, it's, right, it's, it's, controlling, it's controlling a differential. Ultimately, that's what AXVs do. They are a pressure differential control device, which so is a pressure regulator. And technically, so is a, um, Honestly, if we really got down to it, short of a solenoid, it's what all these do. They control pressure differential across them. Now, in reality, uh, these three are specifically designed to operate off of pressure differential, and so is a TXV. Like part of a TXV's design, it, it, the pressure difference between high side and low side of the system plays a part in the spring action, even on a regular TXV. So when you start running really high head pressures, I mean, all of that plays into what's happening on those internal springs and the actions happening against them. So in the same way here with an AXV, essentially you'll have this real big bulbous uh, head and it'll, it'll, essentially it'll be about the same size, I didn't really draw it that well, as, as the, the power head that sits on top. And it will still have a power head looking thing sitting on top of it. And uh, that does hold a charge. Um, and inside this cap, though, it'll, it will. It'll have this little, this little uh, typically a brass uh, screw-on cap that, uh, that seals. Now, this is not supposed to have refrigerant pressure on it, so you can take that cap off and service it, but they do leak. So don't, you know, if, if, if this valve has failed or the seals in this power head have failed, 
There is a pathway to allow refrigerant to escape up through here. So be careful of that. I think I've only seen that once, maybe. I don't know. I'm trying to remember. Anyway, uh, ultimately, what's inside here is a little uh, disc. That'll, typically, it'll have an Allen uh, style uh, uh, point in the middle to where you can put an Allen wrench in there and uh, you can adjust the spring coils that are inside of this to increase or decrease spring pressure, which is um, uh, adjusting how the, um, trying to make sure I draw this the best I can, is adjusting how the spring opens and closes internal inside of here. So that one you see is based on the suction pressure then? So it's, it's factoring the pressure difference across it mixed with the counteracting spring pressures. So ultimately, the, the more you push this down, so the more you thread the, the adjustment uh, ring in. So the more you load the springs. Yeah, the, yeah, there you go. The more you load the springs, the higher or the lower the DP, the diff diff pressure differential you'll create across. And you know, the more you back it off, the more it backs off of that spring seat and allows less flow, which increases pressure differential. Righty, tidy, lefty, loosey. And that's ultimately what it's doing is you calibrate this and you, have, you need to be in that low load state. Uh, you, you have to set this in the condition it needs to function in. And uh, what will happen is, uh, now this does react to a degree um, to ambient temperatures. That's one of the things about AXVs is they're pressure differential devices, but uh, they, they do, with the, that power head will respond to pressures or to temperature changes. Anyway, ultimately though, it's really monitoring that pressure differential. And so when it sees the differential begin to increase beyond its, its spring set points, then it will begin to uh, force this valve open and it will allow more flow through, which will lower the head pressure some, and it'll allow more uh, hot gas to enter the suction pressure, which then raises your saturation. It sounds incredibly difficult to diagnose that you have, say, a restriction in your... Well, ultimately, if, if you're trying to diagnose it, uh, which a lot of times these will have a solenoid valve that, uh, ahead of them. Right, so if we're, if we're in stage two and we don't want this thing to operate, we'll put a solenoid right here, uh, pre this valve, and won't allow any flow through there. Okay, because yeah, I was immediately thinking, say, say you've got like a restriction on your liquid line, well, now you're creating a massive pressure differential across, your, across what that would be, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then, well, you could possibly hide your restriction that way, couldn't you? Well, you're still gonna have a superheat issue. So, if, if, say, this was to, if you were to have something that's going to cause a high differential, like you said, liquid line restricts. So your superheat would be low then because you'd be flooding your evac, right? No, because if you have a restricted liquid line, you're not letting enough liquid through. Right, but then it would be going through right there from your... Right, so you're letting discharge pressure through. Okay. Unprocessed discharge pressure. And at that point you have more discharge gas than you do the, what is supposed to be the equivalent of the flash gas. So the saturation might be falsely up, but the superheat's going to be skyrocket through the roof. Okay. Because, you know, say so your dryer right here, Right, or whatever. Anyway, you're not getting refrigerant through to your metering device anymore. Mm -hmm. But you're not going off on, say, high head pressure because, well, this is bypassing enough. 
to accomplish it. Now, that is if it was ever able to get to this condition. Yeah. One reason why you probably wouldn't see this condition is, again, we're controlling based off of either uh, return error load. You know, so say it's a, a, a data unit, a uh, crack system, then we're monitoring return error. And when return error gets above X amount, whatever, we stage up. Uh, it could be doing it off of uh, discharge error, but a lot of times uh, they'll base their staging off of return. So at that point, you're no longer processing your load. So it's getting warm in the space and return is going up. So which means we should be staging up, which means we should be staging out the hot gas, gotcha. right? Um, at the same time, say it was an IntelliPak. All right, again, we're, we're staging up and we, we, our discharge error is not meeting set point, so we need to bring more in. And ultimately, we should not be running our hot gas at that point. Okay, I'm following. Now, there's... So only if it was, like, say, a single stage hot gas bypass, which I think you would probably really ever find, right? Single so stage. Like one compressor, one circuit, or anything, you wouldn't really be running a hot gas bypass then, would you? You wouldn't, you wouldn't have anything to stage up. I think I answered my own question. Carry on. Well, ultimately, so data systems, a lot of times it'll be one compressor with a hot gas circuit. So the stage up would be dropping out the hot gas. Right, but on the automatic expansion valve, it's based on pressure. Mm -hmm. Differential pressure. I'm just, I'm just saying what you're saying. It makes sense. But in my head, I still haven't drawn it out yet to where it works. That's okay. This is... These concepts are challenging to understand from a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And they really, it's something you, you end up having to, you, you, the goal here is try your best to get the theory, and then you're going to have to just take this and do your best to apply it in the field enough times until it makes sense. Like I understand the whole concept of the, the hot gas bypass part. It's just the AXV part is where I'm mm. Pressure seems to likely fluctuate. Yeah, well, again, that's, that's when it's being activated. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to factor that in. So, um, but that's part of the things that make them in, imperfect. Like, that is genuinely, that's one of the struggles. That's why a, a lot of people really do struggle with these types of systems because they're not easy to balance. They're not. I can tell you that right now. It doesn't matter, well, these two are adjustable, this one is not, and these are not. So, uh, HPR valve, whatever it's set to, it is what it is. It either works or it don't. Uh, ultimately, to troubleshoot it, uh, if, say, that solenoid is activated for this valve, but you don't have flow, and you've got a high differential, then you might check the cap and see, well, did somebody, um, uh, has somebody adjusted it you know, too far? You might try making an adjustment on it. And if no matter what you do, you can't get this thing to respond, even though you've got differential across it, then it's very likely, yeah, that the springs or something in that valve are probably bad. Maybe the diaphragm busted, who knows? Um, and ultimately, that can be done with just a temperature, temperature across. And the same thing for uh, really any of these. Yeah, you, you, you're, if they're functioning, they're not going to have much temperature difference. All right? So if it's, if it's um, you know, if they're putting in a discharge pressure of 150 degrees, you know, uh, say the system is working properly. You're, you're going into a lower pressure, so you will see some temperature drop, but it's not going to be a neutral temperature, right? Typically, uh, when these things aren't flowing at all or aren't flowing enough, you know, you may have 150 coming in, but you may have, say, 80, 90 coming out. Or, yeah, it'll be around ambient temperature. Um, and that's if you get the 150 coming in. Right. 
if it's truly not flowing at all, both sides of that, that line are going to stay ambient unless this valve is super close to the discharge. Like carriers. Carriers, I think, is right next to the compressors. Yeah, yeah. If it's within just a couple of feet of the physical discharge uh, line, then yes, you're going to see the temperature just radiate through that pipe. That is true. Uh, but you go down that pipe a little ways, you know, say several more feet, and you're going to find that that temperature didn't stay consistent, but it should have. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Uh, the carrier, large carrier RTUs, their hot gas bypass is pretty close to the compressors. I would say the building I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, they're, a lot of them will be. Like it, trains are inside the actual lower cavity, no? No, they're outside of the condenser. Yeah, the IntelliPak, it'll, there'll be a line. I, I drew it way up here just for the sake of my drawing. Right. But in reality, they're usually within, in terms of, of line set, they're usually within uh, a few feet of the discharge line coming out of the compressor. There'll be some sort of T or some kind of takeoff coming off of it. And it's going to be pulling straight hot gas. Right, I'm where the actual valve is located, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. usually that'll be close to the compressor. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of if I've seen one close to the EVAP. I don't believe I have. Because part of what you've got to be careful with is if this valve was located down here, uh, and most of the time, these are, say, say you're talking about an air-cooled system. Yeah, because you're going to have pressure drop as you go through. Well, not even just the pressure drop. You're going to have oil trap. Yeah. You've created a big oil trap. That's true. Because uh, in reality, it would typically, say, be down here. And this is a physical representation. It's physically lower than. So if this line ran down here and then up, this whole section in between turns into one big oil trap. So it, it is better to have it right here within a short distance of the stub out. With a, I mean, a few feet's not that big a deal, ultimately. Yeah, especially considering the lines are close to these. Right. Um, but that's what can happen. It's not a, not a guarantee, but it can. Uh, so yes, AXV, uh, automatic expansion valve. They're pressure differential devices. And H, or a, a pressure regulator is uh, a lot more, ultimately their main function, it's about differential pressure, but you're really setting the, um, you're setting the, uh, you're setting a set pressure. Like you, do, you want your uh, evaporator to stay above X pressure. And they act a lot more specific to that pressure, typically. So um, when it comes to physical design, it's, it's uh, a lot of them. They'll just be one straight one straight thing here, just one big long thing, and they'll have a uh, an input. Actually, this will be typically the incoming. This will be the leaving, and they'll make kind of a 90 shape a lot of the time. Uh, and you'll still have so there'll be a chamber in here where this seals. You'll have a uh, a piece sticking up with a cap on it. It'll have the same or it'll have a similar spring mechanism design. It doesn't have the, uh, the head piece of it. It's nothing more, it doesn't have any, it has nothing more than spring and refrigerant uh, pressure acting on it. It doesn't have a, a, like a, a power head uh, piece influencing anything. No temperature influence. Okay. So, uh, this is a, uh, I usually see these on more industrial, I'm trying to picture, it's been a long time since I actually have run into one, honestly. A lot of them, 
especially newer stuff. Like I said, they're going to EXV based or they're just doing straight solenoids anymore. Uh, it, head pressure uh, regulating valves or control valves are honestly more low temp side. I did, I did want to bring it up because they are a thing. They are part of a hot gas bypass. Uh, so uh, yeah, typically HPR valves will actually, uh, they're regulating more of a head pressure. So instead of truly a bypass into the suction, they're bypassing back into the liquid to okay, he keep so head that, pressures that elevated. Would you want to not increase the load on your evaporator? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, these serve a little bit of a different function. I'm not going to go crazy into that just because it's not really what we work on, but I did want to mention that they do exist. Uh, they will look like, they'll look like an actual uh, EXV, I'm sorry, TXV without a sensing bulb. They'll have a power head. It'll be, a lot of times, it'll be kind of a more of a domed shape, a little funky looking power head instead of a, a, a traditional sporlin, real flat top and kind of like a big, big hat looking thing, right? Uh, they, they won't look, they won't have that same style power head assembly. So with an HDR, you wouldn't typically see that with a loader as well because they're kind of accomplishing the same practice? Mm. No, I mean, you, ultimately you could, the, the point of HPR is still to regulate under, honestly, they're more of a low ambient load. So they're bypassing to regulate for low outside temperatures, not necessarily inside. Okay. The rest of these, their focus is the inside saturation and HPR is focused on the outside saturation. So, so head pressure control, right, head pressure. exactly. So with that, you you would you wouldn't necessarily need fan cycling. Okay. So if you had a head pressure regulator, you won't need fan cycle control. You just use that. The fans can run all the time as normal, and that's just going to bypass enough hot gas from the condenser to where it's going to keep your liquid line elevated where you need it. So that it still can properly still have your differentials, it can still feed, and you can still do all the stuff it's supposed to do. Um, yeah, again, the adjustment on these is basically the same. So pressure pressure uh, regulators are specifically that their their function and their goal in, in life is to just try to maintain a minimum pressure set point. Uh, like I said, uh, we we. We see that a lot on uh, more industrial side applications. Uh, I've had some process coolers running, uh, cooling on machinery that they typically will use a pressure regulator as uh, out at the condenser or something to kind of help uh, regulate their side of it. Uh, they can also be used for, um, like I said, if they're at the condenser for a head pressure control to where we keep a minimum head pressure and then uh, you might have an AXV maintaining um, uh, evaporator saturation or pressure. So I've, I've had systems, yeah, I've had systems like that to where at the, at the condenser you had a pressure regulator helping maintain condenser pressure so that it couldn't go too low. And so and it, 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 then that scenario again, you didn't have fan cycling, they just the fans turned on when the uh, it's a little mini chiller with a remote condenser. Uh, when it was running and processing, uh, this was maintaining a minimum head pressure, and the AXV was maintaining a minimum evaporator saturation. And in a system like that, you know, a lot of times you're dealing with heavily swinging loads. So in this particular case, yeah, this was a system would deal with huge surge loads and process that like crazy and load way the heck up and then they would finish their testing. It was their testing vacuum equipment. They would finish their, their, their tests and then uh, all their test equipment would shut down uh, and then just the load on the system would just, just fall out just completely. So these types of setups help them regulate in those extreme scenarios and then the in-between, when they're actually loaded, you know, it doesn't really need them. You could just get a variable speed compressor and a variable speed fan and call it a day. Well, even if you had a variable speed compressor, though, you, you still, 
it would work, but it costs a lot more. A lot less people know how to work on it, and that's still new technology. As far as the industry is concerned, that's still new. So, you know, it's, it's hard to conceptualize that because y'all yourselves are new, so this is the only thing you've ever known. We work on it a lot. Right, and we do. We see them more and more and more. But uh, this, this stuff has not been this... You're seeing it as it literally is becoming more standard. You're watching it happen. Those of us who've been around a little bit longer know that what's changed, right? Uh, yeah. Again, that, that requires a very sophisticated control system. It's very expensive. That is true. I didn't think of that part. I was just thinking of the actual running mm -hmm. of it. And that might help, even if it was variable speed, um, it, I don't know, I'd have to sit and really think about it. I don't know that it would eliminate the need for these still. I mean, at the lower load, it would help to a degree, but I don't know, because you can only go so low. Yeah, no, I'm thinking about it too. So, um, I don't know, it, it's, it's a good challenge question, one I don't have a good answer for. Ultimately, solenoids, I pretty well explain that. Pretty, pretty basic. You just solenoid fires, bypasses, keep saturation up. Uh, a lot of your RTUs, they can do it as part of a stage sequence, uh, or let's see, it can be based off of um, ambient and load conditions. So for solenoid and EXV, obviously you have a sensor somewhere. Where would that usually be located on your system? Would it be on your a lot of times, the, like a, an IntelliPak has thermistors at the distributor. Okay. And so you may have a, a sensor at the distributor and you'll have one mounted to the suction line. And that's how it's reading saturation at the distributor. And so it's seeing the difference between the, the distributor temp, which should be your physical saturation, like literal saturation, uh, and the suction temp. And the difference there is your superheat across. And so that's how like an IntelliPak, even though there's not a transducer one on the whole system, will give you a high superheat alarm. Okay. Or even, a, uh, well, will it do a low? It might even do a low, I don't remember. I've never seen a low, I've seen high. Yeah, I've seen the high superheats. That's, that one's not that uncommon. And a lot of times, it's just a bad thermistor. Okay. Thermistor went out, replace it, down the road. Uh, so yeah, solenoids. That's how they find EXV. I mean, EXV's at that point, it's you got a system that's actually monitoring physical pressure most of the time. It's got transducers, it's got all the bells and whistles, and it knows that it needs to open X amount uh, to maintain a minimum evaporator pressure so that it doesn't go into a freezing state. Uh, and it will work in unison with the evaporator EXV. So they'll, they'll work simultaneously. So assuming all of these EXV version of this is probably the most efficient? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because, again, uh, an Aeon is a prime example. A Daikin Rebel is another example. Uh, Daikin Rebels, well, the, technically that's, that's not a hot gas. That one, Daikin Rebels use theirs for reheat. So I'll get into that in a second. But uh, Aeons, they do reheat too. But they also have hot gas. So some of the older Aeons, uh, they are using, they may have some EXVs, but they're also using an a, uh, AXV. I say that twice. Older Aeons are using EXVs, and they may have an AXV for hot gas. Okay. So you might see both in that scenario. But most of all, the newer style, they're going to be EXV all the way around. So you might have EXV on the... EVAP valve, EXVs for reheat valves, and you'll have EXVs for um, bypass. Okay. 